Hello everyone and welcome to our first lecture of the reproductive system. Uh, this will be broken up into three parts covering the male anatomy, female anatomy, and the major hormones that are influencing the reproductive system. To begin with, we need to identify the primary sex organs or gonads and for the male that is the testes and for the female ovaries. This is where the production of sperm and egg are going to occur. Uh, the process that does this is called meiosis, not mitosis. We'll talk about the differences a little later on in this lecture. Uh, but these are our sex cells. Uh, there are some differences. Uh, men produce four equal size sperm from that process of meiosis, whereas women produce one very large egg and three polar bodies. When I say large, it's almost visible to the naked eye. It's about 2,000 of the size of, you have to excuse that, the size of a sperm. Um, from a biologist's perspective, the reproductive system is by far the most important. And no matter what species you think of in life, they all reproduce. I mean, right now, going through the spring, all the pollen in the air basically is nothing more than plant sperm. Every living species, cockroaches, humans, sharks, I mean, you name it, the goal of life from a biological perspective is easily reproduction. Uh, the process allows you to generate a great deal of genetic variation, which allows uh, natural selection to take its action from there. We'll begin with the male reproductive system, and this is a good overview. You'll want to come back uh, to this slide. All these parts we're basically going to be talking about, and your job is to simply ask, what do they do? And we'll be going over the functions of the seminal vesicle, you know, the prostate gland, of course, the testes, penis, epididymis, all these different things and asking what are their major functions. And then this image here gives you uh, all their locations. Uh, first, you notice that the vas deferens here passes through the ingual canal, up over the bladder, then wraps back around, connecting into the ejaculatory duct here at the prostate gland. This pathway is so strange, instead of just going from here straight to the urethra, and that is because the testes are actually abdominal organs that descend over time into the scrotum. But they begin roughly where the ovaries were as well in a female. The scrotum itself is just simply containing the paired testes. Uh, it does have a job. Uh, it keeps the testicles about 3 degrees Celsius lower than the core body temperature. And if it gets too warm, sperm production does not occur. Um, the temperature is maintained by two sets of muscles that will contract and relax the scrotum. You can see the dartus muscle here and the cremaciter. Uh, these two sets of muscles will raise the testicles when it is uh, too cold and relax when it gets a little too warm. Each of the surrounding, um, each of the testes is surrounded by two tunics, uh, tunica vaginalis and tunica albuginae. Uh, it's also called the fibrous capsule. Uh, these are just the real tough connective tissue um, coatings. Uh, the tunic albuginae actually will divide the testes into lobules. Uh, 250 to 300, they'll contain these little tiny coiled up tubes where spermatogenesis is going to occur. And these are called seminiferous tubules. And this is where sperm are actually produced at. Now in between these tubules you'll find lots of interstitial cells. That's where you're going to produce uh, your major hormones, the androgens of the male, such as testosterone. If you look here, you can see uh, the tunica, um, and it divides the testes into these lobules. And inside each lobule, you'll find this coiled tube or seminiferous tubule for sperm production. Uh, you'll also notice this kind of coma-shaped guy here. This is the epididymis, and this is where sperm typically are stored and mature at. And you can see a continuation of the vas deferens, and it's going to run on up and refer back to your other slide for that one. This is a microscopic image, and if you were to take a slice of testes, you could find, you know, a seminiferous tubule here. This would be the opening, or the lumen, and you can actually see the sperm. All these little heads are, are going to be sperm that you see here and over here that will eventually mature and be dumped out into this seminiferous tubule lumen. Uh, the interstitial cells, these will be the ones responsible for the production of hormones like testosterone, which we will talk about in another lecture. The epididymis, you've already seen an image of, is that coma-shaped 
coiled tube that's attached to the testes. Its function, mature and store sperm. Uh, the microvilli actually absorb uh, testicular fluids and pass these nutrients on to the sperm. Uh, now the sperm at this stage are not motile and they'll slowly pass through the epididymis and become fully functioning and motile. Uh, during ejaculation, the epididymis will contract and expel the sperm into the vas deferens, or sometimes called the ductus deferens here. For the function of the vas deferens, you simply need to know it's the, it's the tube that's going to carry the sperm uh, to the ejaculatory duct. It's going to join there with the duct from the seminal vesicle, and at that point on, this is all happening in the prostate gland, uh, you're going to call that the urethra from there on out. Uh, the urethra in a male is responsible for delivery of sperm and urine. It does take that strange pathway passing through the ingual canal and that is simply because once again testicles are actually abdominal organs. Peristalsis, common term by now, is what moves uh, sperm along just like is what's moving food along in your stomach. A vasectomy is simply where you cut the vas deferens and that will uh, prevent um, sperm from passing out and very effective at preventing childbirth. Not 100%. You know, there can be mess ups and can regrow. And there's actually reversal surgeries. I'm not sure the success rates on those, but uh, if you do have a vasectomy and decide later you want kids, there is a micro vasectomy reversal nowadays. The seminal vesicle is what actually produces what we call semen. Now, semen is going to be a complex mixture of substances with the sperm all mixed in. It's located right there at the base of the bladder, connecting into the prostate gland. Um, 60 to 70 percent of what you call um, semen is, is from this gland. Mostly sugar, and this is the food source for the sperm. Uh, they have very powerful little flagella, so they need uh, lots of sugar to make ATP to run that, their mitochondria. A vitamin C, prostaglandins, uh, this will stimulate muscle contractions actually in the female. And there's lots of other substances that activate nerve sperm. And recently they figured out that there are hormones and substances that can actually influence the female. In other words, uh, the act of sexual intercourse can actually cause the female to ovulate a little early. So say around normal ovulation day is 14 and you have unprotected sex on day 13, your chances go way up because semen actually causes ovulation. Prostate gland encircles the upper part of the urethra and it actually secretes a milky fluid that helps activate sperm. Uh, it's a gland, so very prone to cancer. The female have a prostate gland, it's just more or less a, a vestigial gland, sometimes called the skeins gland. I'll let y'all Google that one if you want to. That's the actual function. Now the prostate, since it encircles the urethra, it can cause issues when it swells and if you've got prostate swelling, uh, urination can become difficult and prostate cancer can actually get uh, quite dangerous. The bulbourethral gland is another tiny gland, sometimes called the Cowper's gland, inferior to the prostate and it'll produce this clear mucus that actually cleanses the urethra and acts as a lubricant during uh, sexual intercourse. The semen itself is you know, mostly coming from the seminal vesicle but semen as a whole has got the sperm mixed in as well. You've got the fructose and prostaglandins, which uh, stimulate that reverse peristalsis in the uterus and help pull the sperm up the uterus to the fallopian tubes where they will eventually meet an egg. The alkalinity of semen helps neutralize the acidic nature of the vaginal tract. Uh, the vagina is actually very uh, harsh to semen, so semen acts as protective nature to keep the sperm alive. Semen inhibits bacterial multiplication and on average 20 to 40 million sperm cells per milliliter. And that's the current average. And they've actually noticed that that has gone down over the years uh, when you're going back and comparing averages say from the early 1900s. The average ejaculate of semen is between 2 and 7 milliliters so you know if you add that up say you got 5 milliliters of ejaculate 20 million sperm so Anywhere from 100 to 250 or so million sperm will be in the ejaculate. Uh, clotting factors help coagulate the semen just after ejaculation. And then fiber analysis liquefies it. This is about 20 minutes later. So this will happen actually inside the female. And, and they'll start to spread out and begin the, the process of 
of heading up the uterus and into the fallopian tubes. And the uterus, besides the contractions, prostaglandin stimulates, actually has cilia that will help along the way. And then, of course, the tail uh, provides some propulsion in the sperm. The penis is a visibly external part. Of course, there's a shaft. The tip is called the glans penis, um, which is actually the same thing as the clitoris in the female. Now, the prepus or foreskin is the covering over the glands. Uh, many times that is removed by circumcision. The penis is basically made of two spongy tissues, corpus spongiosum and corpus cavernosum. If we take a look at those two here on this slide, what basically happens is that the blood vessels get leaky or dilated and, and these tissues fill with blood and that's what actually causes uh, an erection. An erection is, is a parasympathetic process. Um, it's one of those calm down sides of the nervous system. It's ran by the release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide um, actually causes vasodilation. Uh, famously, the little blue pill Viagra acts on nitric oxide levels. If you increase those levels, then you cause erections. But it is a parasympathetic reflex, whereas the process of ejaculation is actually run by the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, and this causes all these ducts and accessory glands and muscles to basically all contract at once and expel the semen out. The bladder sphincter muscle actually constricts during this process and this is what prevents uh, urination during the process of ejaculation. <clears throat> Spermatogenesis is what happens in a man uh, that actually is the process of making sperm. Now, occurring in the seminiferous tubules it is meiosis. Now normally a cell in our body has 46 chromosomes or is diploid in. Our sperm or eggs actually are in or haploid number of 23. This is not mitosis. Mitosis is how you divide and get new skin cells and bone cells and things of this nature. Meiosis only occurs in sperm and egg and it's actually two consecutive divisions. So you take this normal cell and you cut it in half down to 23 and then you divide it again and give yourself four cells total instead of two. Um, so we're producing a total of four dotal cells. And in males, they all equal size, and we get all four of them. In females, it, it happens a little different. We all get really one really large cell and three tiny cells that don't do much of anything. And this process creates a massive amount of genetic variation. The DNA it, during meiosis gets crossed over. In other words, segments of chromosomes jump from one to another, and, and this is recombining. And then, of course, you don't know which sperm and which egg are going to meet. So there's a great deal of variability in the process of sex. And that's the actual advantage of it. Uh, that's why there is sex on this planet. Um, there's been a question in biology for a long time because so many cells and, and many species actually do quite well by just dividing. Uh, they don't go through the sexual process. They just clone themselves. It's much more efficient and you pass on 100% of your DNA. Uh, so the question is, why sex? Why all the trouble to find a mate and maintain a relationship with that mate um, in in nature and you know um, have to share your genetics and not get to pass on all of your genetics at once but the the advantage exists right here sex generates massive amounts of variation and all of you know that if you have kids or have ever been around kids or uh, at all they're not exactly like their parents on the uh, this side here you have the typical mitosis and I'm not going to review everything, but there are four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Basically, in mitosis, say a skin cell will divide into two brand new skin cells having the exact same genetics as the original cell. Whereas in meiosis, you don't have these chromosomes line up like these individuals here. You actually have them pair, and this pairing is where you'll get crossing over or synapses, or say the green portion will cross over here to the purple portion and so forth. And when you do metaphase one, you pull the entire chromosome over to the side. You don't split it in half, like into two sticks like happens here. So what this does is cut your genetics down. You're going from 46 normal human cell down to 23 after meiosis one. And then meiosis two proceeds exactly like mitosis. You do split the chromosomes, and that's what gives you 23, 23, 23, and 23. Um, all those cells there. Here's an overview of mitosis and meiosis and some of the differences. You know, one division versus two divisions. 
synapsis does not occur, so there's no jumbling up of the DNA to create variation. It does occur, crossing over in meiosis. You can read over those and, and pay attention to those differences and just know the main the major differences between those two. This shows the process of spermatogenesis actually occurring inside a seminiferous tubule. We begin up here with just a normal old cell, a cell capable of becoming a sperm or a spermatogonium. Uh, these cells here, the sustentacular cells, actually provide nutrients to this process. Well, the spermatogonium will break free and turn into a primary spermatocyte and then into a secondary spermatocyte. It is at the level of the secondary spermatocyte that you've actually cut your DNA um, in half. So they was, these would be 23 chromosomes each. Then they go ahead and divide into early spermatids and then into sperm and then they would be into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules and, and finalize their maturation actually in the um, epididymis. So this shows you the process with the 2N and N thing. It shows you the spermatids and these spermatozoa, which are still not fully functioning yet. They still have this excess cytoplasm here. Uh, but they will uh, actually mature you know, 20 days or so in the epididymis into fully functioning sperm capable of inducing pregnancy. That's a scanning electron microscope view. This is a seminiferous tubule here. And these are the tails, as you can see, of sperm. There's a little head of one and a tail of one actually being produced and there's a there's a blood vessel so this is actually a seminiferous tubule um, all blown up 225 times under an electron microscope which gives you a very detailed image of the outsides of these cells and the process of producing sperm sperm itself is just basically a head a midpiece and a tail the head contains the genetic material the dna and an acrosome which contains the enzymes that are going to be needed to penetrate the egg. They actually have to break through and, and digest um, the zones around the egg. And there are protein receptors that allow the egg to, and sperm to attach to each other. Um, the midpiece is where you contain all your mitochondria. These are what power, produce the ATP to power this flagellum, which is used for the locomotion. And you can see basically typical sperm here. An acrosome with the enzymes to break down the egg, genetic material in the nucleus, the DNA, mitochondria, all in the midpiece, and then the flagellum. Typical old bacterial like flagellum. Real life image here, once again, scanning electron microscope. Uh, this one's colored. Um, the electron microscope always takes uh, black and white images, but you can artificially color them later.